All right, Hebrews 10, 38 and 39 says this, but my righteous one will live by faith. My soul takes no pleasure in anyone who shrinks back, but we are not among those who shrink back and are so lost, but among those who have faith and are saved. We're talking about redefining faith. Now, the common question is, why does faith need to be redefined. And really, growing up in a church environment, faith was one of the most confusing things that I would come across because it's a belief you have. It's something that you're hoping for. And really, that definition gets muddy over time, especially, to be honest, in the 80s and 90s when faith was associated with material things that you were trying to claim that you would have in your life. So what happens is faith is often associated with material things that we're desiring to have, and we miss the essence of what the biblical understanding of faith actually is. So because we've been so undefined in what faith is, culture has defined it for us as simply a religious belief. But we know that faith is so much more than that. And just even in verses like this, in Hebrews 10, 38, and 39, we find that righteousness and faith are closely intertwined. That whenever you see faith or faithfulness, uh, you know, acknowledged in the Bible, righteousness is close behind. And this is really important, especially being in a church where we believe in the gifts, we believe in the supernatural, that God can show up in a minute. Often, righteousness is separate from the faith we tend to express. When we talk about faith, we talk about the gift of faith. We talk about healing, signs and wonders, and miracles. But we have to understand and recognize the warning that Jesus gave in Matthew 7, that there are many that will prophesy and do wonders in my name, yet not know me. See, faith and righteousness are intertwined. Being in a right relationship with God is paramount to having faith in our life. And what we've done is we've separated faith from faithfulness. We have people that are faithful, but maybe they don't have lives of faith. That it doesn't exist in the Bible. See, we're called to live these faithful lives that first come from God's faithfulness, and in return, we have faith and trust Him in the journey. And at times when God leads us to do things that seem irresponsible or not appropriate in culture, we trust that He's in charge of the outcome. We trust that no matter how crazy it may seem, that we're going to trust him. And we look at Hebrews chapter 11 and all these wild faith journeys where they had no idea what to do other than hear God's voice. And every time they stepped forward, it seemed crazy, but God always showed up. This is the beauty of our journey of faith. So what we notice is one of the main pictures of what faith is, particularly in the Old Testament, is they associate faith and righteousness being like a tree. That if you are faithful and you are righteous, you will grow. And you'll hear this term, oaks of righteousness, or the trees of Lebanon, or the oaks of Lebanon that they described. And one of the kind of paramount verses in Psalms that was used to describe this that they would quote quite often in synagogues was Psalm chapter 1, verse 3. It says this about the righteous and the faithful. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they they prosper. It gives this picture of a tree that has a root system that is moving towards the living water of God. That as you have righteousness and faithfulness in your life, your root system will grow deep. And as you're there, you'll be able to weather the storms that come against you in various seasons. You produce fruit in its right season. How many want fruitful lives? Let's hear that. Just this week, it was Monday, uh, we had our tree taken down in our backyard. Here's a couple pictures of this. My good friend Michael Ganchenko uh, has, a, has a business called Kingdom Tree Services. Now, Michael is amazing. Uh, he used to be a cameraman here at the church. So if you ever saw that cameraman just praising the Lord and not moving the camera, and you're online wondering, what, what on earth is online doing? Why aren't they moving the camera? That was Michael worshiping at that time. <laughs> Michael's one of the best, one of the best evangelists I've ever met. So here's our tree in the backyard. This is the process of them cutting it down. We can go to the next slide here as they're timbering it in our backyard. One more slide as uh, I believe my wife is cutting it down with a chainsaw right there. Yes, my wife is fierce and resilient. So this is the tree. So again, beautiful tree provided tremendous shade, but I love this picture. Again, we didn't really want to take the tree down, but when we bought our house, we have this very strange koi pond in our backyard. Thank you, Mark and Corey Daiba, for your help with that. They run a pond company. But again, I'm not a, a, a pond person. I'm not like, oh man, I really like fish, but we have to clean the tank and all this stuff. Well, what we found is that this beautiful tree in our backyard had such a deep root system that was going towards the water, it was going to break the pond. 
and the roots were moving the foundation underneath the side garage because, the, listen to this, the root system was disruptive. I love that phrase. The roots were disruptive. It's this picture of the righteous where the root system goes so deep, it changes the culture around it. See, that's the picture that God wants us to have. As your righteousness and faithfulness matures and goes deep, you start to change the atmosphere and the soils around you. And that's the picture of faith, that as we grow in our faith, as we grow in our righteousness, we will provide shade and structure and we'll also change things around us to become fruitful lands. Now, again, this was a negative example in my house, but you get the picture of what I'm trying to communicate. Contrast that with this, our house in Rock. Uh, several years ago, we were renting a house in Rockland, and one morning, it was a Saturday morning, 7 a.m., I get this real aggressive knock on the front door. So I'm thinking to myself, what happened? Is there an emergency? I opened the door. A neighbor I had never seen before says, what are you going to do about it? I said, good morning. How, how are you? What, do about what? He's like, what are you going to do about the tree? I said, what are, you, what are you talking about? He's like, you don't know? So no, he's like, look right in your front yard. And here's a picture that I took several years ago as this tree collapsed onto the neighbor's house in our front yard. So again, this tree was massive and we thought was healthy, but as it was there one morning, it literally split in two as the trunk went and fell on kind of their awning. By God's grace, no one was out there at the time. It ends up being his mother's house. He was coming over to take care of her. Uh, but again, smashed part of the house. This is what we woke up to on the Saturday morning. So as the city came out, here was the diagnosis. The soil was soft and its roots were shallow. Soft soil and shallow roots, when storms come, will often cause the demise of things that look great. See, the goal of righteousness and faithfulness is that we have a deep, mature relationship with God. That we're not consumed with our reach, but we're consumed with our depth and knowing who we are in Christ. This is the picture of faithfulness. So, again, when you see others that share stories of miracles, it doesn't mean you have less faith. You have different faith. It's expressed in different ways. The goal is faithfulness. Do you trust what God is leading you to do? Will you withstand the storms by the faithfulness that you've matured in your life? This is the context of Hebrews 11. It's about an encouraging word to those that were facing trials of various kinds. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. But recall those in earlier days when after you had been enlightened, you what? You endured a hard struggle with sufferings. How many have endured some hard struggles with sufferings in their life? This is who they're writing to. Sometimes being publicly exposed to abuse and persecution, and sometimes being partners with those that were treated. For you had compassion for those who were in prison, and you cheerfully accepted, I love this, the plundering of your possessions, knowing that you yourselves possessed something better and more lasting. The faithful acknowledge that we're not living for this life, but the age to come. That the world can take whatever it wants from us. The enemy can take whatever it wants, but cannot take the love and devotion or separate us from the God that cares for you. This is that picture. So this morning, we're going to study a story. It's an obscure story in Hebrews 11, but really models a life of faithfulness. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. It'll be a familiar story for some here, but Genesis chapter 37, verse 3. We're going to look at the life of Joseph. Genesis 37, verse 3 says this. Now Israel, this is speaking of Jacob, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now the moment, you see that first verse there, now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Let's just mark this out. Favoritism does not work in families. So we see this dysfunction from the get-go, which really was modeled by his father, Isaac, where he had a favorite son in Esau. So now we see this generational model that's becoming a generational curse start to manifest in this family. And there's massive dysfunction where now this father has showed favoritism to his son, Joseph, the son of his old age, which really meant his favorite wife. Again, a very different time than we live in today. And as that was taking place, they started to hate him. 
They started to have contempt towards him. Now he gives him this robe to make it worse. He gives him this robe, what many of us have called the coat of many colors. Here's a picture of what we often translate it as. This is not what Joseph looked like. This is what we think it was. But really, in the Hebrew, it's, it's a very crude language than the Greek and the Latin translated it, coat of many colors. It really is just a royal robe. That's the best picture. So it's like you red or blue or purple. It just distinguished him from his siblings. So as he's given this, this was the right of the firstborn. Now, the question is, why would Joseph get this and not Reuben? Reuben was the true firstborn. Why would Joseph get this and it forfeit Reuben? Because Reuben decided to sleep with one of his father's wives. Probably not a good thing to do in that time or any time in culture. This family is the definition of dysfunction. The Kardashians would watch this and be like, man, go to counseling. This is that type of picture that we're talking about. This is a dysfunctional household. So he shows this favoritism, declaring that he will get half of his father's possessions. So he's the one that will be the rightful heir of the father because Jacob was mistreated by his own father and his own brother. So now he has this preferential treatment and gives it to his favorite wife's son, Joseph. Verse 5, once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Joseph lacks social awareness. Verse 6, he said to them, listen to this dream that I dreamed. There were binding sheaves in the field, and suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. Then our sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. There's a distinguishment there. It's not just the fact that Joseph has this dream. He continues to go on and on about it. He's flaunting the revelation of God. Now again, these men, I hate to say it, are very carnal. They probably don't have much of a relationship with God, as we'll see in a few minutes here. So he's talking about these divine dreams he's getting, and they've all heard the legend of their father Jacob encountering angels, and now Joseph is doing the same. So they probably correlate it with this. Because our father Jacob gave him the mantle, now he knows the God that we don't know. That's the picture. So now they are enraged and they're hating him. And he goes on and on and on. This is a valuable lesson. See, God's inviting J Joseph into a personal revelation about a future promise. But it's not for public disposal. See, here's what we have to recognize and understand. God's personal revelation to you does not mean it's for you and Facebook. It does not mean it's for you and all your friends. Let God speak to you personally. If you steward those words he gives you, he will give you more words down the road. See, I cannot stand going on Instagram or Facebook and seeing people's like devotional selfies. It's the worst. Where they do this, you know what I'm talking about. Bible opened. <laughs> Coffee strategically portioned. Phone out. Just me and Jesus. No, it's you, Jesus, and all your social media friends. That's who it is right now. See, if I was there taking pictures of my wife to show my friends all the time, that's not an intimate relationship. That's strange. That's weird. Why do we do it with the very living Lord that wants a relationship with you? Let God speak to you personally. Let him be the source of your affirmation, not likes and hearts you get on your social media account. That's the distortion. He's the one that fills the vacuum. And I'll just be honest with you. When we see that, we see insecurity. We don't see confidence. So again, let's just expose it for what it is. It shows insecurity and need for affirmation, not the need for God speaking great divine revelation to you. See, he wants to invite you in to a personal relationship with him. Where I love that, where David would rival the sun. He would want to wake up before the sun rose so that he could say good morning to God. This is that picture of a relationship that God is desiring for us to have. Now, I get stage of life. We have four young children that really just love this great joke of not letting us sleep through the night. It's, they, I, I swear they conspire at night just on how, who's going to wake up dad and mom when. 
But again, we have to be, I used to be one of those early risers, devotional time, prayer time, and God quickly got a hold of me with that with my young children. So you have to be creative. The key thing is how are you connecting with God on a regular basis? How are you meeting him and forming relationship with him? So Joseph decides to flaunt these revelations to his brothers. Verse 11. So his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Let's go and underline that word jealous in your Bible. Now, this is something we don't talk about often. And the word jealousy used here is a very aggressive word. It means to become red, to become heated, to be enraged. This is a vehement anger. See, they've already talked about the hate towards their brother, and they kind of capstone it with this jealousy. Now, in our culture, we are riddled with jealousy and envy, but we've chosen to use the word comparison because it sounds a lot nicer. So we talk about comparison often, and there's these studies now of jealousy and envy going throughout our culture that we just called comparison or interest. Here's a stat that the New York Post said. More than half, 56% of millennials say they've posted a photo on social media to make it look like they were staying, eating, or visiting somewhere more expensive than they actually were to create jealousy and make themselves appear more desirable. That's the picture. One, this, more than half of the people are trying to create these pseudo realities to provoke jealousy or we would call it become more desirable, needing affirmation, and it's continuing to move forward in our culture. Elon Musk, the crazy super genius who's incredibly rich, said this, with Instagram, people appear happier and more attractive than they actually are, resulting in others' unhappiness. The truth of the matter is that those appear happiest are often the most unhappy people. We're creating a culture where our images are defining us, and most of the images we see are filtered and touched up in a way to appear more desirable. What's happening is your brain is creating this response system saying, I want what they have or I want to be them. This is where jealousy and envy come in. We call it comparison. So as I looked up comparison this week and found these studies, I actually found, to my surprise, that comparison is actually not a bad thing. Comparison is a God-designed thing. Oxford Dictionary on Comparison. They have all these studies. See, comparison is not the enemy here. It's the motive behind it. See, as a child, you're born with comparison. That's how you grow and mature. So when you have, again, internal comparison, you're comparing yourself to your parental figure to learn how to walk, to learn how to speak, to learn how to eat. This is where comparison metrics come in. Because what you do is you say, I do it this way, they do it this way. I'm desiring to grow and mature and do it like them. That's the whole image of comparison. Later on in life, the really the basic understanding is as comparison, if there's a skill I want to learn, I will compare myself doing that skill to someone else so I can grow and mature or become that. Comparison also worked in villages where you understood that you had a natural skill set or a gift and you would compare yourself to others and say, well, I'm not as good as them at that. I'm not as good as them at that, but I'm better than this and this will help our village prosper in the long run. This is the natural design. So when we're fighting comparison, we're actually fighting the wrong thing. See, comparison is the vehicle. What matters is what's accompanying you on the ride. See, comparison is not the problem. It's who your companion that really matters. And often the companion is envy, jealousy, or pride. And when envy, jealousy, and pride are alongside of you, your destination becomes distorted. But if your comparison companion is growth and maturity, guess what? You'll grow. See, I would desire to become someone like Francis. I watch his life, his transparency, his humility. I will compare myself against him and be like, I'm not as humble and transparent as he is. Therefore, I want to grow and model my life after our leaders or those that you respect or desire to be like. What happens with envy and jealousy and pride is they come in and you tend to lower the status of others to help fill the vacuum of affirmation that you desire to have filled that only God can. That's the picture that takes place. Now, envy and jealousy are often used interchangeably, but they're actually different. Now, jealousy speaks of an object of desire. So, Let's say that Tracy has an object that I desire. I'm jealous for that object. Now, if I were to achieve or gain that object, my jealousy would go away because I have 
now what I wanted from him. Does that make sense? Envy is, a, is its jealous infuriation towards your rival is what it speaks of. So your rival has something that you desire, but when you envy them, you actually want to see the demise of your rival while you are acquiring what they have. That's the picture. Envy and jealousy move together. Now, we can often think to ourselves, well, I'm not very jealous. I'm not very envious. I don't want a lot of things in my life. They've done studies now that gen envy and jealousy change with age. That as you get older, you actually struggle with different desires that you work with. Here's one study real quick before we move on. Jealousy and envy across adulthood. This is the slide. Teenage and 20s, you envy social success. So when you look around, you evaluate your peers and you compare yourself with them to determine if you're better than them by the friends you have or the image you carry. That's the greatest struggle that we have in our teenage and 20s. 30s and 40s becomes occupational success. What you've accomplished in life. So are you have a good job, you're getting paid better in this way, or they've done more than this, or they're just taking this vacation, or I'm not taking that vacation. That's the envy and jealousy that we tend to struggle with. Lastly, when you're in your 40s, late 50s and 60s, it's wealth. It's what have people acquired. What do they have that I don't have accumulatively? The spouse, house, cars, boats, we have to keep ourselves in check. So the Bible talks about, we, we are never unsusceptible to these things. We have to ask ourselves, what are those things, those ways that the enemy is trying to lure me away from the call that God has for us? So again, his brothers are consumed with the envy and jealousy and they're missing out on the call that God has for them. Now, again, God had a call and destiny for all those brothers, absolutely. But they were consumed with jealousy, envy, and rage. And they missed what God was wanting to do with them, even in the midst of favoritism and preferential parenting. It continues in verse 14. So he said to them, now this is Jacob speaking, go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring me word. So he sent him down the, the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. What's happening here? So the brothers, they are really good at sheep farming. So again, Jacob had this gift where he really learned how to multiply his business. And from that place, they've now inherited their dad's business. They would take them to different pasture lands in different seasons to feed these sheep. So they had, I mean, probably near a thousand sheep, realistically, that they are herding together. So they're sent here, and they go a great distance. They're about 50 miles away. And Jacob sends... Joseph to go check on his brothers. Now, on the surface, this appears like a normal thing, but here's where the dance comes in. He says, go check on the well-being of them. Go make sure that they're peaceable and not causing trouble. That's the real image that's behind them. So Jacob sends Joseph to go babysit his brothers when there's already great contention between them. Why would he need to do this? Well, in Genesis 34, the brothers slaughtered a bunch of people in Shechem because they took advantage of their sister Diana. So this is a very violent brotherhood. So they now go to the place. He lets them go to the place where they've caused previous trouble. He knew they were going to Shechem. He knew that they were going there, and he allows them to do so after they've already pillaged that community. So he says, can you go check on them and make sure they don't cause any trouble? What we really have here is an issue of an absent father. This is a father abdicating his responsibility. He compromises the safety of his son because he doesn't want to address the problem in the family. See, these are out-of-control kids that this father has abdicated responsibility with and is not stepping into his rightful place as leader of that household. Now, again, I have a very strong wife. I love my wife. We are strong together. We are co-parent models. But again, I know that responsibility for the house between me and the Lord falls on my shoulders. I have to hear what God is saying to my family collectively with my wife, but follow directions at times that may seem counterproductive to what the world is showing us to do. Jacob has forfeited that responsibility and is endangering his son. This is a challenge to step into rightful positions of leadership. If you're a single parent, this is a challenge to step in rightful positions of leadership and not putting unrealistic responsibility upon our children. That's really responsibility we should carry out. 
So he compromises his teenage son's safety, sends him on a 50-mile journey on his, by himself without any companions, under-resourced. It's a very bad decision. Number one lesson we learn from Joseph, don't go anywhere alone. We're not called to travel on our own. Community Sunday for a reason. Mark was like, how are you going to get community in here? I got it, Mark. <laughs> Do not travel to the destinations you're called to on your own. The biblical model is they always had people alongside of them. Jesus never sent his disciples out on their own. They were sent two by two. We see this model over and over again. Paul had companions. Peter had companions. This is the purpose of community. It's not just for your success. It's for your safety. So when you have them around you, they have your back. They're with you. They're moving forward. He goes under-resourced. He travels approximately 65 miles. So just to give a picture of this, this is the equivalent of traveling from Sacramento to San Francisco on foot. Here's the reality. It's unpaved land on foot that's really treacherous. That's like walking from here to San Francisco. There's no roads, there's no common land, there are mountains and ravines and treacherous places that he's walking through. This is a difficult journey, this is not a wise move. He's walking to brothers and then is also going to have to journey back with brothers that hate him. This is not, this is not smart in any, any semblance of the word. He gets there. As he's walking closer to them, verse 18, they saw him from a distance. And before he came near, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. This is breeze of the enemy. This is violent and evil. This is that same voice of the snake in Genesis 3. It's a dark, dark place. They use this word, cunning words. They devised a plan. They conspired against him. This, this means insidious evil. An insidious evil play. And see, the enemy is using them as bait to destroy the dreams that Joseph has, that God has breathed in his life. This is that picture of the enemy roaming around like a roaring lion. That's the picture here. He's looking to devour. And now they're pawns of the enemy. And as they're there and they're looking at him, they call him this dreamer. It's translated the master of dreams. See, they mock the call of God in his life but yet at the same time echo what will be his success down the road. See, the enemy can recognize a gift. He'll just try to misappropriate it or discourage it. So he has this grace to dream, and God has these dreams. This is how it works. When God is maturing dreams in you, the enemy is very well aware of them. This is the key part of righteousness and faithfulness. See, as your roots go deep, the test of the enemies will not devour you. You'll be able to overcome those trials and tribulation. So they move forward, and as they're there, they devise this horrible plan. Verse 23, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore. They strip him of his status. They strip him of his identity. Here's the important lesson for us to learn. Your status is not your significance. Your status is not your significance. Your success is your sonship. See, there's an important understanding of sonship in the Bible. Now, we call it children of God or family of God. The reason why Paul uses sonship so often to describe our relationship with God is actually an invitation to become rightful heirs no matter what gender you are. The sons were favored in that culture. So when Paul would declare that you were sons of God, he was inviting the women of those communities into a relationship as heirs with a prime premier inheritance. That's the whole picture. So you're invited into equal standing. So they strip him of his significance, but the key lesson is God does not see your significance in your status. Your significance is defined by who he says you are as his children. That's the picture. They're there, and he's left vulnerable. He's left naked. They throw him into this pit, verse 24. And they took him to the pit. They threw him in, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. They use a double word here to say how chilling it is, how cold it is, how dark it is. There's no light available in this cistern. And as he's there, cold, damp, and naked in that dry place, we learn that this is the preparation for our future purpose. See, God uses your present pain for future purpose. 
What happens a few years down the road, actually many years down the road, he helps save a people from a severe famine and drought. It's in those dry places that God produces pain in you that allows you to overcome and accomplish future promise and purpose. Whatever the painful dry place you're in right now, I guarantee God will redeem it down the road. God will use that as a lifeline of purpose and help to others in time of need. This is that dry place. You're in it right now. We often want to forsake the dry place and leave it behind. That's the mature, maturation process. That's the refiner's fire. That's when the gold is most purified. And he's in this dry, dark place. But will he allow the Lord to fulfill him? And as they're there, they start to conspire and Reuben goes off and Reuben actually had a soft spot for Joseph and he starts to allude of, well, why don't we not kill him? Why don't we, why don't we sell him? So he's thinking he can devise a plan. He actually has a, a good heart in this. He's come to understanding that what they've done is wrong. So Reuben goes off probably to tend the herds, but as they're there, some traders come. They say, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's sell him off. And they're there eating over the sister and their brother is trapped in. This just shows the callousness of hate and hurt that they have. And as these traders walk by, they decide to sell their brother for 20 shekels. Now, here's a picture of a shekel that we can see at the time there. A shekel was maybe a day's wage. About a half a shekel was a day's wage. So they sell him for 20 shekels. Now, a university did a study on what that was actually worth at the time. 20 shekels was the price of a female slave which was actually considered, again, we, uh, God's grace, we live in a different time, lesser than half a man is what they sold him for. So they sell him for 20 shekels, but they then divide it amongst 10 brothers. So as the 10 brothers are there, each person gets two shekels. Now these men are sheep farmer. The cost of a sheep was two shekels. They exchanged their brother for just some more cattle. They exchanged their brother for some, just some more sheep. You could also buy a square meter of land for two shekels. They really do this not for profit or gain, but because they despise him. And Joseph hears this, and just imagine the brokenness, the promise that he has. He's going to inherit his father's business, half of all he has, and now he's being sold for less than the most desirable slave. He's being sold for, the, for 10 sheep. This is a low point in his life, a point that many of us may have been in. And God's saying, don't give up. And as he's there, Reuben comes back. He says, what have you done? He said, well, we sold him. He realizes what's happened here. And they take the row when they dip it in goat's blood. And as they bring it back to their father, they say, your son, not their brother, your son has been devoured. We found him. And Jacob breaks it down. And here's the story behind the story. There was four ways in which they believed God would judge someone. We find this in Ezekiel. It was pestilence, famine, drought, and wild beasts. So what they communicate is this. God's judged you and Joseph for how vile you've been. They communicate the judgment of God upon Jacob and Joseph that Jacob is responsible for his son's death. It's a dark time. It says they attempt to comfort him. One scholar says how quick we are to find the pseudo comforters in our life. See, in those times of brokenness, we have to find our healing and comfort in the community of God and the comfort of God alone, not the false comforts the world tends to offer. Those pseudo fake comforts, those false comforts only leads to our demise and our destruction, not our fulfillment. And they're there and he's broken. And next we have Joseph and he's in this place and he doesn't know where he is and he's sold to some Egyptians and he's now in this house of Potiphar in Genesis 39. And as he's there with a language he does not know, distinguished skin. They know that he's a lesser slave. He's of some obscure tribe, a tribe called Israel. And as he's there, it says in verse two, the Lord was with him. God has stood by his side. Now we hear no mention of his family until chapter 41, which is intentional to show that he's truly alone, that his only companion is the Lord. 
the one that he finds his affirmation in, his affection in, his hope and companionship in, is the Lord. This is the revelation of the faith that Joseph had, that he trusted God even in the darkest times. And as he's there, it says that he was granted success. Now, success in our culture is viewed as possessions by what you acquire or what you attain. Now, success and slave are not synonyms. You would never call a slave successful. Therefore, the definition of success has to be different from a biblical context. The word success translated in the crude way here is breakthrough. It literally is the picture of someone chopping dry wood in half. God grants Joseph breakthrough in the place of slavery. He gives him breakthrough. He starts to prosper and blesses the house of his wicked commander, Potiphar. See, this is the picture of the Christian life. You may have the most vile, evil boss on the planet, but God says, I'm going to bless him because you're there. And through my kindness, they'll come to repentance. Through my love, they'll come to repentance. And they'll know. They may mistreat you. They may malign you. But God's grace and presence are with you in those dark times. They're there alongside of you to accompany you and to help you. And as God's prosperous grace is upon him, all those around him start to recognize the difference that Joseph is standing in. This is our call as believers in the midst of a wicked culture that you'll be distinguished by your walk with God. You are distinguished by the faith that we carry out, that your root system will go deep, that the righteousness of God will mature in you, that you would disrupt the areas around you to bring fruitfulness. This is the picture of Psalm 1, verse 3, that you are that tree next to the living water of God that has fruit in season. Joseph was that man with that life that was fruitful even in the barren land, that found the water of God even in the dry places. As we close this morning, it's a great quote from Matthew Henry, the old school scholar. It says this, Our enemies may strip us of outward distinctions and ornaments, but wisdom and grace cannot be taken from us. They may separate us from friends, relatives, and country, but they cannot take us from the presence of the Lord. They may shut us of outward blessings, rob us of liberty, and confine us in dungeons, but they cannot shut us from communion with God, from the throne of grace, or take us from the blessings of salvation. Joseph was blessed, wonderfully blessed, even in the house where he was a slave. God's presence with us makes all we do prosperous. God is with us. Let's just pray together. Fight up, Amanda. Father, we thank you that you're with us in our dark times, in our tragic times. That God, right now there are some here that are in dark, dry places where there is no water. God, we thank you that you are the one that provides water for our souls. Hope when there is no hope. Help when we seem helpless. God, we pray that you would come and extend your hand and affirm your presence with my friends today. As they are struggling with their faith, as their faith feels fragile, as they feel like there's no hope or resolve near them, God, we thank you that you are by our side in those dark times and dark places. Just right now, eyes closed. You say, you know what? I've been in a season of trial, and I need to know that the Lord is with me. Just lift your hand up if that's you. Father, we just thank you that you are our comforter and our friend, that we are not alone that you are with us, that you never leave us or forsake us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that you have towards us. Lord, we just come against discouragement, the breaking that many have experienced. God, we just welcome your healing. We welcome your hope. Lord, we silence every lie of the enemy that would say that you are lesser than. God, we receive the life and promise that you alone have for us.